It's Wednesday, November 27th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. In light of a recent massive sexual exploitation case in St. John's, we are asking, are we doing enough to protect children and vulnerable people in this province? Today's show will drill into that question, give you context, answers, and possible solutions. Newfoundland and Labrador is a province that lived through and learned about what happened at Mount Cashel. Christian Brothers ran that orphanage. Allegations of abuse at Mount Cashel span from the late 1940s to the 1980s. In total, 369 people have come forward claiming they were abused physically or sexually by people under the watch of the Archdiocese of St. John's, including the Christian Brothers at Mount Cashel. The allegations led to the Hughes Inquiry. There's also, the case of Zachary Turner in 2003, a baby who was murdered led to reports and recommendations of sweeping changes for the child protection system. Decades later, there are now questions about a different case with calls to find out how it happened and questions about this province's system, right? This most recent case, 82-year-old former taxi driver Bruce Escott at the center of the massive sexual exploitation case in St. John's pleaded guilty to seven charges last week, including four counts of sexual assault, two counts of sexual interference, and one count of sexual exploitation. He pleaded guilty to at least one charge for each of the six victims he was accused of abusing. Seven other counts were dropped as part of a plea deal with the Crown. Escott lived in a trailer by the airport in St. John's, just down the street from his co-accused Tony Humby. The agreed statement of facts in Escott's case alleged the two men worked in concert with Escott, often driving the boys to Humby's trailer and abusing them in the car. Humby, who was 64, has pleaded not guilty and is scheduled for trial in March. Escott will be back in court on January 31st for sentencing submissions. He will uh, not likely be sentenced that day, but at a later court appearance. So once again, we're asking here on the signal today, are we doing enough to protect children and vulnerable people in this province? Have we learned from the past. If you want to text us, 709-327-8206, email us, thesignal at cbc.ca. Joining me in the studio, Lynn Moore is a lawyer who works almost exclusively in the area of sexual abuse litigation, and Angela Crockwell, Executive Director of Thrive, an organization that works to help and support vulnerable people. Welcome to you both. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having us. Thanks. So as we've learned about uh, from the allegations and what, what's come in court through this most recent case, for your positions, what have your thoughts been? Lynn, we'll go with you. Um, my thoughts are that this was totally foreseeable, uh, given the changes that the government made to the legislation, the child protection legislation in 2010. They changed the definition of a child in need of protection so that uh, you had to be at risk from your parents, not at risk from people like Eskett and Humby. And um, by doing that, it meant that they were, uh, that th- these types of exploitation were no longer the mandate of child protection. It wasn't their job to be concerned about this. And uh, it's very, to me, very, very likely that if you stop protecting children, children are going to be hurt. Okay. And we, I mean, the, it, the legislative side of this, there, we'll be drilling down into that uh, through this hour. Uh, Angela? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think for um, myself and the work that we do at Thrive, unfortunately, we weren't surprised. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to Lynn's point, I think there's a lot more to be done around the prevention and early intervention um, for uh, children and youth in this province. But also, as you, in your introduction, you know, spoke about the Hughes inquiry and some of the other inquiries, like, I do think about that. And where are the lessons learned? And, um, you know, we we have been down this road before, and um, t- to be here in 2024 is deeply troubling and concerning and... Um, you know, it just is frustrating when you think, um, you know, of, of the repetitive nature of hearing like stories like not just this one, but other stories as well. Talk a bit more then as well before we've got 
some tape to get to of other voices, um, and, and there's, there's there are a lot of points to get through the, for this conversation today. But uh, and, and you've both obviously been in the media many times before. But talk a bit more about the the work that you've been doing over the years, uh, Angela. Yeah. So. Um I mean, one of the big things that we do is around the anti-exploitation of young people. And we have a coalition and we've been doing that for um, about 15 years and have really been trying to like sound the alarm that there are lots of young people in this province who have been victimized or at high risk of sexual exploitation. And often, you know, as many times as we've done training and awareness and media and all of the things we still get is not really happening here. So like that, that message, trying to help the general public, parents, people who work with young people um, have this understanding is really critical. And it's interesting we're doing this show today. We actually have over 100 people right now up at the Holiday Inn doing a anti-exploitation event and training and heard from a survivor this morning um, talk about the need for awareness and education and as a province as a whole, the understanding that this is happening all over this province. What, why don't you think, for, for folks to not understand, for folks to be like, is this happening here over and over again over the years, given the history of this province, wh- why do you think that is? That's a really good question, and we've certainly grappled with it because, again, we've been talking about it so long and to still feel like it's not breaking through. I'm not really sure why. Um, you know, I think there's this... Um, sense that as a province we you know we care for each other we're a very safe you know province people you know are doing okay um, we don't hurt each other um, so I don't know if that is like that be- deep belief then helps people kind of not believe some of the awful things that really do happen for people in this province. Is some of it perhaps othering as well? No, 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 that's that I mean that that's them and that was then, but uh, you know, the regular day-to-day is different for for me and mine and us. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And when you think about people who are really vulnerable, um there there's definitely an othering factor to that. Okay. Then so I've tried through my work to bring forward the issue of sexual exploitation, sexual assault of children by talking about it as openly as I can. But I would agree with Angela that a lot of people believe that this is a past problem. But this is not a past problem. It is a problem that's happening right now. Uh, my firm has had calls within the past month of people who are in care now who are being sexually assaulted now. And uh, it is a rampant problem. And it is a a problem that we really have not taken any strategic steps to eradicate. And and there can be steps taken, there can be things done. But there is this sense of, you know, Newfoundland and Labrador being this place where the people are great. And I'm not saying that people aren't great here. But we punch above our weight when it comes to child sexual abuse. We have more in this problem than they do in other provinces. We have more exploitation. We have more um, family violence. We have a lot of problems in our society. And our belief in um, ourselves as a a friendly and loving people is not uh, concordant with the rates of violence that we have against vulnerable people. Yeah, and I will say on Monday of this week, we did a show about the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Um, folks, it's on the podcast if you want to go back and listen to it. Uh, when we talk about solutions on, this, on that show, uh, we've got uh, the YWCA's uh, new strategic plan and what they're trying to do in and around it if you missed that show. When it comes to child protection in this province, a few people know more than uh, former Mon professor Ken Barter. Uh, he chaired the university's child protection research program from 1998 to 2003. He's taught generations of social workers and has long advocated for a a fundamental change in the way governments, plural, do child protection. He chaired the university's child protection research program, like I said, right from 98 to 2003. And CBC reporter Ryan Cook caught up with Ken Barter. So he lives in Victoria, BC right now. Ryan spoke with him and here is part of that conversation. The case that we're talking about today is one of alleged abuse where many of the teens involved were in the care or the supervision of the province. I'm just wondering what came to mind when you heard about this case. 
Well, when you alerted me to it, I, uh, I kind of uh, did the little bit of research and did some uh, reading of what you wrote about it. And I kind of just shook my head and said, like, here we go again. Um, many, many incidents over the past 50 years in Newfoundland similar to this, some more tragic with child deaths and so on. Um, the, what keeps coming to my mind is why after so much has been done, particularly in Newfoundland and Labrador, but it's not unique to Newfoundland and Labrador, every province and territory in Canada is experiencing the same, the same thing. And I'm beginning to wonder uh, because the, the, the response when something like this happens is the public begin to question, uh, you know, well, what's happening? What is the Child Protection Authority doing about this? Uh, we've heard about this before. There's been reports that have been done. Inquiries have been made, as we've seen in Newfoundland, going back to the Mount Cashel, the Hughes Inquiry, right on up to many of the reports that the Child Advocates Office had filed over the past number of years. And it seems to me like, are we not learning? Are we not learning from those experiences? We've, we've seen uh, changes in legislation. We've seen new legislation replacing old legislation again and again. We've seen new departments formed. We've seen ministers being let go. We've seen new policies and new procedures. We've seen investments in resources, more resources. Uh, there's been changes in administrative. It's governed by, delivered by government, then it's delegated to the health authorities, then it's taken back to government again. So the public of Newfoundland and Labrador must be really wondering what is happening? Like, why is it after all these d different attempts that the outcomes for children and youth seem to not be acceptable. So what is happening? I mean, we've had hundreds of recommendations, and when you look at it, many of them have been implemented. So why aren't outcomes changing, as you say? Like, what, what is happening? Well, that's, that's a very good question. What, what is happening? Well, one, one thing for, so, for sure, that the Newfoundland and Labrador public, as the Canadian public, there's, there's two certainties when it comes to child protection. Number one is the families who require or need intervention services, child protection services, they are struggling. There's no question about it. They are struggling with all sorts of issues from uh, capacities, parent capacities, to housing, to food insecurity. But the number two reality is that the, the, the systems designed to protect them are also struggling. There's massive vacancy rates, there's rigid policies, it's highly bureaucratized, it's highly legalized, and it's two certainties that we can't seem to come to grips with on how to approach it. The one thing also that we know is the child protection system as it currently exists in Newfoundland and Labrador and elsewhere in Canada, it is referral based, it is involuntary, it is crisis driven, it's highly bureaucratized and it's reactive in, in its approach. The policies and procedures and the response seems to not reflect the realities of what we know in terms of the research and the literature of how we could better protect children and be of better support to the families. And I've come to the conclusion after so many years involved in this field that I believe child protection is more about parents and families in need of support and assistance more so than kids being need, in need of protection. And that's where I think 
child protection needs to expand its parameters beyond the four walls of parenting and move more into the community, the economic, and the political arena. Because one of the expressions that I used to say to my students, child protection is not rocket science. It's far more complex than that. Uh, something you mentioned before, there's a line from a 2016 Child and Youth Advocate report that says, uh, once again, the same deficiencies are identified in this investigation as those that came before. Once again, it is evident that even though recommendations are being addressed, it is not resulting in the necessary changes. That's a pretty strong condemnation of in action. And the advocate has been engaged again to do another review of policies and procedures in this case. And based upon that statement alone, the advocate should respond to the premier saying, what good will it do us to do another policy and procedure review? Like something more needs to be done. So as Mun pre professor retired, uh, Ken Barter there, uh, Professor Barter, I chaired the university's uh, child protection research program from 98 to 03. He was speaking with CBC reporter Ryan Cook, who has done, uh, him and uh, Rob Antle with the investigative unit, they have done uh, a lot of reporting around the uh, recent massive sexual exploitation case in St. John's, which is uh, the jumping off point for this show we're doing today. And we're asking, are we doing enough to protect children and vulnerable people in this province? I'm Adam Walsh. This is The Signal. We're also asking, have we learned from the past? We're filling in those gaps. We've got context. We're working towards solutions. The text line today is open, 709-327-8206, if you have thoughts you want to share. The email uh, address for the show, the signal at cbc.ca. I've got Lynn Moore, lawyer, uh, here in studio with me, and Angela Crockwell, executive director of Thrive. Any thoughts there? I mean, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Barter had a lot to say. Uh, any thoughts from you both? Uh, yes, I, I would just like to say that my criticisms here of the child protection system are not leveled at the frontline social workers. Yeah. Um, those people need support. They need a supportive environment. When you have massive turnover, you have to recognize as an employer that you're doing something wrong. You can't keep people. You can get them, but you can't keep them. And why is that? Those social workers need to be supported. They need not to have the finger pointed at them when something goes wrong. They need to be supported. Foster families need to be supported. They can't be looked at as warehouses, as robots who are designed to take care of children. Foster families are new families for a child for a time or maybe for their whole lives. Who, who knows how long it's going to be? You have to support those people, keep them in the game, keep them in the loop. And what is really at play under all of this is poverty and a lack of support. And those changes that we talked about in 20. 10, they took out prevention. So the professor talked about us being reactive when what we need to be is proactive. We need to bring back a poverty reduction strategy. We need to make sure that people are supported, that there are mental health supports, that there are treatment places for people to, for kids to go when they have addictions issues, that, you know, if they're willing to engage in, in those issues, there need to be supports for mental health. Like, there is very little out there for young people today or adults. I mean, the parents need to be supported, too. How do you think that is possible in a time when we've labeled ourselves, the government has labeled this province as a well-being province, there's a health accord, there's an education accord, there's lots of talk about social determinants of health, which Professor Barter was bringing up in that, and yet you're talking about everything that's missing. How is this possible? I, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, I mean, I really, I really yeah. don't understand why this is not improving. But the the basics are not there, and and the removal of prevention services from the child protection legislation in 2010 was a devastating blow to helping families. Devastating. Angela. Yeah, I agree with Lynn. I think that early again that support and and. Um, as Ken spoke about as well, like it's not about being reactive. It is about supporting families uh, at an early age. We know, I mean, in this province, the number of young people who are in care has been increasing. We know the outcomes for young people who have been through that system are really not great. It is a huge financial investment. And why are we not putting those resources into families prior to um, there's ever a need for a removal. So once we remove, we'll do a huge financial investment into making sure that young person is you know, in care and has supervision and all of those things. We also know young people who live in group homes 
um, can often be targeted for um, exploitation and trafficking. Um, and why are we not providing that level of financial and resource support to families earlier um, to keep them out of that system? And to Lynn's point, um, again, not about the frontline social workers. That is a really challenging um, job. Yeah. The system needs to be um, reimagined. We need to do better up front, uh, early intervention, early prevention. We need to support families who are struggling. Um, and so we, we just really need to rethink that system as opposed to the reactive um, response that we see now. You know, we're talking about um, having more food available in school, schools for children. And w- I think about that. That's a great thing. Sure. Like, I agree with that. More, more food in schools. But why? Why do we need food in schools? Like, families can't afford to feed their children. Like, the, the, the poverty is really at, at the root of it. And the I, I remember when I did my political science degree, our professor said that, well, when they're determining the social assistance rates, they look at what you need to live on, and then they give you two-thirds of that, so you're motivated to leave the social assistance uh, system. But... That doesn't motivate people. That starves them. You know, it it deprives them of the basic necessities that they need. And it it just is, uh, you know, the the problem is that we have children that are hungry. We have parents that are stressed. We have people that can't cope, and we're not helping them. And this is a province that does not peg social assistance to inflation, although it used to under the poverty reduction strategy of the Williams government. Just putting that out there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous for people trying to get by, especially since COVID and prices have gone through the roof. So we're talking politics, right? Um, It's come up. We've talked about legislation. So the folks who make the legislation are the folks in the House of Assembly, the MHAs. Uh, Here's a flavor of political discussion around, again, this most recent uh, massive sexual sexual exploitation case, which I mentioned at the start of the show, which is uh, the through line through much of this conversation uh, today. So we're going to go to the House of Assembly on November 20th. You will hear leader of the opposition, PC uh, leader Tony Wakeham, and then you'll hear uh, Liberal Justice Minister uh, Bernard Davis and Minister of Children, Seniors and Social Development Paul Pike. Uh, PC leader Wakeham starts with uh, calls for a public inquiry. Let's take a listen. Speaker, calls from the legal community have increased for a public inquiry into the horrible alleged abuse by Tony Humby and Bruce Escott. I asked the Premier, will you do the right thing and call a public inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for a a very uh, uh, strong question here today. Um, This matter is still ongoing an investigation, undergoing an investigation. We cannot jeopardize the criminal uh, process to let the prosecution move forward. Um, with this case, a uh, public inquiry is, is an option that could be considered in the future. Uh, after the legal matters are determined, uh, we don't want to jeopardize that legal future for that. The Honourable, the Leader of Official Opposition. Speaker, I too do not want to jeopardize any legal proceedings, but we do have it now that the Child and Youth Advocate is reviewing. But the Child and Youth Advocate will not, and I repeat, not examine police involvement in these cases. Specifically, why Tony Humby was repeatedly investigated over the years but never charged. Speaker, don't these victims deserve an answer? The Honorable Minister of Children, Seniors and Social Development. Speaker, the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate has a mandate to protect and promote the rights of children. The Office of the, of the Child Advocate is well positioned and uh, has the legislative authority to carry out a review in this particular case. The advocate also has subpoena powers. So people can, they can call people in to uh, get their opinions, to get their views, if they know, uh, if whatever they need from them, they can get, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a person who is in uh, the position of the advocate can complete a full investigation or a full review using these powers. The Honourable, the Leader of Official Opposition. Speaker, we have already been told by the Premier's office that the Child Youth Review will not include a police review. That's already been said to us. And again, I have heard from current RNC officers and former RNC officers who have told me that this investigation needs 
to happen. That's what they told me. This needs to happen. So again, Mr. Humby was investigated nine times between 2007 and 2021, but was never charged till last year. Again, the Child and Youth Advocate Review will never get to the bottom of the fundamental justice question. How did this abuse happen in the care of the province for so long? How did it happen? The Honorable the Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I'll, I'll reiterate what I said before. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the, the Honorable Member. What I am saying is that this is still ongoing investigation. We cannot jeopardize an investigation or a criminal process that is being uh, led by the prosecution as they move forward. Um, a public inquiry, I'm, we're not saying no to a public inquiry on this side of the House. We're saying that investigation has to occur. The RNC and the RCMP and those that would be involved are going to continue those investigations. When that investigation is complete, we'll look at what the results are, and then we'll go from there. The Honorable, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, again, I, I ask the uh, Minister if the opportunity why, why there may be possible that these two things could happen simultaneously. But I think it's very important that we get the answers that these children deserve. Debate from the House of Assembly on November 20th. There you heard uh, Opposition Leader Tony Wakeham, uh, Justice Minister Bernard Davis, and Minister of Children, Seniors, and Social Development Paul Pike. From my guests uh, here uh, in the studio, Lynn Moore, Angela Crockwell, uh, thoughts thoughts on – so that's the, the, the political discussion that's happening around this, right? So w- listening to that with everything we've been talking about so far, what do you think about it? Well, it's disappointing to me that they're not talking about the problems with the legislation that exists. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the that legislation was brought in under a Tory government. We've had a liberal government since 2015. Um, and that that legislation is, I think, woefully inadequate. Um, would a public inquiry help? I would hope it would help. I think that we would need one to get to the bottom of this particular um, matter. Um, but I, I just... I, I cannot express how disturbing it is that the government has changed the definition of a child in need of protection and um, pedophiles uh, who are not parents are not the subject of child protection's mandate. Like that's not – they could easily say, not my problem. And it should be their problem. So not the parent, right? So that could be the volleyball coach. That could be the figure skating coach. That could be a relative, a neighbor, you name it. If it's not the parent, but anyone like that, and there's, you know, use your Google button uh, or remember what's been in the news. uh, There's lots of instances here of not the parent. Yeah, lots of instances of not the parent. And it's just not child protection's issue anymore. Why do you think they did that? Because they had a review in 2008 which said they were doing a poor job and they said to themselves, well, what do we do now? We're not meeting the needs that we have out there. So are we going to expand what we do? Are we going to infuse resources? Are we going to fundamentally change the system? Or are we going to say, yeah, no, not our business. We'll just we'll just reduce what we do. Uh, we'll take out prevention. We'll stop being worried about children who are the victims of pedophiles. And uh, we'll just do less because we're doing a really bad job of everything. So we'll do less. That's what they decided. And then when you hear the political discussions about the issue of the day, right? The, the, and, and obviously the, the important investigation that has to happen around that. But then, like you said, you're not hearing a discussion around what one would think the political leaders know about, which is the, the existing legislation and what that can mean. Angela, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, an inquiry or a review, if there are lessons learned, is obviously really important for us as a society to identify, understand, but is also then, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to change the system? What legislation needs to change? What types of support need to change? What types of intervention? So is is not good enough to say we learned something. Where was the failures of systems? And then the other piece that really is striking for me is all of the victims. So what are we currently doing to support um, people? What has government offered? Um, and that can often require not like here's like five or six counseling sessions. What is the long-term strategy? Um, because 
a trauma has been perpetrated and for people to um, be able to move on and then not again, be in 10, 15 years, a parent who is highly traumatized without appropriate supports trying to raise their children. Um, you know, I really think there needs to be a lot of resources to support people who've been victimized. And if we talk about the resources to support folks who've been victimized, right? I've done shows mm. on um, soldiers, right, mm. with, with PTSD, and, and we've done shows on the supports and frontline workers that are needed. So can you just Give us an example of, of the types of supports needed for uh, folks who've been victimized in this way. I mean, specialized people who, uh, who have an understanding of trauma yeah. um, and exploitation. And it also needs to be at the pace for the young person. And we hear that all the time that people need to be able to, to identify what is helpful for them, what do they need in this moment, and it should never be time limited. So often it is like you get, you know, five sessions with a counselor, you get 10 sessions with a counselor. But for people to really process and heal from this, it is often years. Um, and when we put those restraints on people, it's not overly helpful. Um, so I think that person-centered, what do you need, what will be helpful, um, is really important to have those conversations um, with the people who've been harmed so that we're responding in a way that's actually helpful for them. Yeah, we're talking from counseling also to just the support of of functioning day to day from laundry to schedules to to maintaining a, a house and, and everything else. I mean, the support is the whole gamut of that, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. And for the families, like, I mean, for all of um, the individuals who've been harmed through, say, this specific case, there are families attached um, to those young people who have also now experienced a trauma. Yeah. So, it, you know, it is about how do we help people move on and heal um, from this. And, you know, Adam, some of those young people, it pains me to say, but some of those victims are going to end up in HMP. Uh, there's no question about it. And uh, what does HMP offer in terms of reformation rehabilitation? Right now, nothing. Mm -hmm. There's very, very little. Volunteers can't get in to do programs. They don't have enough staff. You know, it's a rat-infested, moldy, disgusting place, not fit for animals. People don't get better in there. And pretty well, everybody in there is suffering from some kind of trauma. I've got another clip I want to play. So again, uh, so this is a, a follow-up question that CBC reporter Ryan Cook had for retired MUN professor Ken Barter. It's, just, it's a short one, but uh, give it a listen. It's been said to me that by removing those principles, particularly around prevention, that the act essentially made social workers just agents for taking people's kids away and little else. Would, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I would agree. It, 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 placed, it placed social workers in to be totally agents of social control and not social change. It placed social workers into, you know, being highly uh, proceduralized and not being able to use professional autonomy, professional discretion and having, having the freedom and the autonomy to build relationships and to do some of the developmental work that many of the families require. So this is going back to that change in 2010 with legislation. Again, you both said it's not about uh, pointing any fingers at frontline workers who have a hard enough job as it is, to quote you both from earlier in the show. But uh, retired mom prof Ken Barr, they're talking about the reality of what happened with social workers. If things were to be changed or undone or a new, new legislation were to come in, what should the role of social workers be given what we're talking about? Well, social workers should be a support to the family. Let me connect you with counselors. Let me connect you with daycare so that you can um, have five minutes to yourself. Let me uh, help you help your kids uh, so that they're not um, throwing temper tantrums for 15 and 20 minutes. Let me teach you some skills like here's a parenting course. Here's, here's this. They should be working with them, advocating for them, not as they currently are right now. The only tool they have is removal. And, and that's all the tools of the social worker toolbox, right? Like this is what social workers are trained to do. It's everything you're talking about, plus there's counseling. I mean, there's so many different things social workers can do that they're equipped for. 
absolutely. Right. And and there's some of the best counselors that exist are people with a social work background that are helping people figure things out, how to manage, how to cope. But currently, the child protection social workers have just that one tool, removal. And when you take a child from a mother's arms or a father's arms, you are traumatizing that child and you are traumatizing that, that parent and you yourself are traumatized as the social worker because you don't want to be doing that. Like, it's a really ugly scene. Yes, what were you saying? Yeah, and I think back um, to Lynn's point around poverty, and I remember listening to a social worker many years ago talking about uh, supporting a family who was really struggling with poverty, and the um, parent was having a very, very challenging time in terms of being able to meet the parental expectations. And so the recommendation is go do a parenting course. And this social worker said, what would have been really helpful would to give give her diapers um, as opposed to a parenting course. So again, I think it is around those relationships and, and what is helpful um, and being able to, to understand that families are struggling but are, are doing the best that they can and it is relationships. And social workers are totally trained um, to be able to do those relationships, connections, support. And when we're all struggling, often that's that's what we look to our community for. We want to be seen, we want to be understood, and we need some support. I find so anecdotally, right, when I'm out and about talking to folks, there are times when like there could be like a concert in town, or there's something. It, it would be some kind of example of uh, of something that people spend money on, and then the comment is, I'm "Sure, folks can't be doing that bad. The cost of living can't be that bad because look, they're buying this or they're buying that." What's the reality though when it comes to folks in this province that you see if, to, to count like when you if there's a comment like that made what do you see as the reality that people are missing in this province yeah so i think you know we often live in our own little bubbles in our own little worlds and so if i'm doing okay probably a lot of my peers and the people i'm associated with are also doing okay i can tell you from the work that uh we're doing at Thrive, so we're often also having conversations with lots of other frontline community-based yep. organizations. And every time I see somebody else who's doing a similar role and is like, how are you doing? There's a collective, we're drowning out here. The volume of people that are needing support is dramatically increased, but also the depth of struggle that people are facing um, has deepened. So um, while, you know, if... You know, you're not seeing it um, uh, on the front there. line. It, it really doesn't mean it's not there. Lynn, um, in the news today, yesterday, is uh, Georgina's Law, uh, Bill S-249, also known, like I said, as Georgina's Law. Uh, it would give Canada two years to create the strategy to require the government of, uh, of the time to update all houses of parliament on what actions need to be taken to stop intimate partner violence every two years. Uh, the bill's name refers to Georgina McGraw of Branch, uh, an advocate who drew upon her own painful experiences to develop a plan for a national strategy who took her ideas to conservative Senator Fabian Manning. Uh, it's been through the Senate. It's got to go back through the House. It, so this has been out in the news. Uh, we're having a di slightly different discussion today, but it is still the same ballpark. When you look at this legislation, what do you think of for protecting uh, children and vulnerable folks for this province? Well, I think we need something very similar for child protection. Um, and, you know, it's all really branches of the one tree, yeah. domestic violence, uh, children at risk. It's, it's, it's all part and parcel. And the, the beauty of Georgina's law and God bless Georgina McGraw for uh, working on this and, and getting it done. Uh, the beauty of it is, is that it makes the House report on something. It mm. makes them come up with a plan. It makes them focus. And if we could have the same kind of thing for child protection, um, I think that we would be uh, years ahead. Instead of bureaucrats running around trying to develop new policies about how to uh, protect children and how to regulate social workers, if we could really focus on the problem, which is trauma and poverty. If we, could, if we could work towards those solutions, we would see a new generation which is not raised in, in trauma. 
we have we have a lot of work to do with the folks that are out there now who have been raised in trauma. And the government, if you have been raised as a person in care by the child protection system and you have children, then those children are at risk by virtue of the fact that the province raised you. So that really tells you that the system is a complete failure when being raised by the system makes you at risk as a parent. So we need a strategy. We need a plan to go forward. And something like this for child protection would be wonderful. Earlier in in this show, um, we talked, Angela, uh, you mentioned predators, uh, folks around uh, group homes, right? So uh, recently... um, Again, with the, the news that's been covered, this uh, the morning show uh, was doing some coverage on it for St. John's. Uh, retired Crown Prosecutor Mike Murray was on, and the interview was about engaging the child and youth advocate about the most recent sexual exploitation case. Uh, but he, he brought up some points, and he was speaking with the morning show's host, uh, Jen White. So let's uh, listen to what, what uh, the former Crown Prosecutor Mike Murray has to say on it. I mean, this particular incident is really only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, to a large degree, I mean, I don't want to sound alarmist, but I mean, group homes for young people and uh, whether they're there because they're in custody or whether they're there because they don't have anywhere to go, group homes and to a lesser extent, uh, or not even a lesser extent. Another point is women's shelters as well. I mean, are surrounded by a ring of potential predators who are interested in vulnerable people, um, especially with group homes. It's been a long-standing problem all across the province of, I guess, undesirable people given young people uh, money, drugs, cell phones in order to entice them into, uh, I guess, coercive activity of some kind or another. Uh, it's not always strangers. Quite often it can be uh, undesirable family members maybe who there have been abuse allegations against or say adult boyfriends or girlfriends of young people in the home. But it is an ongoing problem and it has happened for years and I've seen it come up many times. So I think that there's a systemic problem that needs to be looked at here. Now, under the uh, child welfare legislation, under Section 18, um, the department can go to court and they can get an order that this person not be allowed to contact the young person. And there are also offense provisions under the child welfare legislation for enticing or harboring a kid away or for providing drugs or obscene materials. But there's no, doesn't seem to be any specific offense for breaking these uh, no contact provisions. And the department has gone to court in many cases and got them. There was one in the Humby and Ascot case. Uh, there was one in that big child abduction case that made the news last year. So it has something, it is something that has been done, but I don't know how enforceable there are there. I don't know if a charge has ever been laid. I mean, I think there needs to be some kind of factual foundation of, you know, how often social workers have asked for these no contact uh, conditions and how often the department has gone to court and how often the orders have been granted and how they've been enforced and whether there's ever been a charge laid under any of the offense provisions under the Child Welfare Act. Retired Crown Prosecutor Mike uh, Murray there uh, speaking on the St. John's Morning Show with host Jen White recently few things there that he said. What do, you, what do you both think? Yeah, I mean, I do think it is important as a society for us to um, recognize when people are at heightened vulnerabilities. So if we have young people who are living in shelters and group homes or go into spaces that we know serves vulnerable people, we've been advocating for this for a long time. People, everybody who works in there should absolutely be trained around um, child abuse, sexual exploitation, recognizing um, the warning signs, knowing how to intervene. There should also be some thought for all of those uh, systems to think about what are we going to do around uh, the possibility that we may be a space that is targeted for recruitment? Uh, how are we going to handle that? Do we have anything in writing in policy? And then um, we've also long advocated for um, some screening around 
um, risk and experiences with abuse and sexual exploitation. Because if we're not having conversations with young people, um, then it often goes unreported and nobody is doing the screening, uh, particularly around exploitation and trafficking. So that has been something that we have certainly advocated for and feel very strongly that not only government systems but community-based systems need to be really thoughtful around how they prevent uh, any further harm to vulnerable folks. So that's Angela Crockwell, their executive director of Thrive. We also have Lynn Moore here uh, in the studio as well, lawyer. Uh, Lynn, any thoughts from you? Well, my thought is that we, um, as a society, we have to be teaching our children about the risks, and we have to do that in the schools. And they've um, slowly, they've been bringing in body safety courses, which is a new thing as well, because to teach young, because we've done a, a show and another follow-up on this uh, around teaching young people even the words to use to identify, to understand what to say for some of this. So there, there's been some movement. I don't think it's in all the schools yet, but the, the, the plan is for it to be in all the schools. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and they did that in the 1980s too. And then they got so many complaints of sexual assault that they stopped because they couldn't right. keep up with it. So, but what I'm talking about is is more broad-based than, than like that body safety. That's, that's important. That has to be a part of it. But we have to talk to uh, kids about sexism. We have to talk to kids about vulnerabilities. We have to talk to kids about about trauma. If something goes bad, then this is how people react. And when we have children in our schools that are acting up or acting out or behaving in a way that we can't tolerate in the schools, we have to deal with those children in a way that is not shaming them or excluding them or suspending them or ex- expelling them. Like we have to make sure that these kids are told how to have conflict. We, like we need social workers in the schools teaching about conflict resolution, about self-regulation, so that kids who are having meltdowns um, are not punished for those meltdowns. You know, for system, the system shut down and I'm having a temper tantrum because I don't understand what's going on because I watched my father beat my mother last night and I'm freaked out and I'm in a state of panic. I need help. I don't need to be expelled for that. You know, like our, our school system really has to change the way they deal with behavioral issues in the classroom. Do you have any idea? I mean, I did a whole show on the uh, education accord. I've done a couple shows on the health accord. It, do, is, do you think this is like, is that message getting through for, for folks around what needs to be considered for the education system, the health system and everything else for everything you're pointing out there? Because it, it is, again, it's a it's a poverty to school, to food insecurity, health, all of it, social determinants of health, full conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not seeing the kind of radical change that we need to make our society a safer place for children. Um, but, uh, you know, there are ways to, to make it happen so that uh, people are healthier and less traumatized and happier. And um, I, I must say, I'm very frustrated with the, the whole idea of zero tolerance of bullying in school, because yeah. that just says, okay, we're not going to tolerate it, so we're going to remove you. But that does not solve the problem. And th- again, through the show, you, you, you keep giving up giving examples of like, well, some was brought forward, but then we found there was a lot of it, like like you said about the '80s, or, or uh, so we stopped doing that. And, and oh, wait, uh, we changed the legislation uh, from a review in '08 to 2010 because well, like we couldn't handle this, and so we're limiting what we're doing. I mean, these are things that you've brought up, and again, with the bullying uh, comparison or example of just saying massive problems, and yet instead of pushing forward, you've been talking through the hour about pulling back over yeah. decades. Yeah. Uh, throughout my life, I have seen this happen time and time again. And uh, what we need is f- fundamental change to how we organize our province and our country um, so that people have enough money to um, meet their basic needs and they have enough supports in the community so that they can deal with their traumas, and they uh, have to change the, uh, the way they think about these uh, about behaviors that, that uh, people engage in. We need a prison system or a, a reformation and rehabilitation system that actually helps people control their behavior instead of locking them up. We need uh, we need better systems overall. We're talking about vulnerable people, right? We talked about group homes. We talked about shelters. So that's person to person. Yep. We have not ish talked about 
the whole world of social media, right? I know there's, uh, I know somewhere here in my inbox, there's new policy on cell phones, smartphones, and schools. Um, internationally, Australia, making it so kids can't access social media anymore, trying to figure out how that works. For either of you, both of you, uh, talk to me about social media and, and, and risk. Yeah, so that's a piece we've really um, been focusing on in the last number of years, recognizing that, you know, while we've mentioned a lot around like vulnerable young people, anybody walking around with access to the internet is also now vulnerable to be targeted for exploitation. Um, and, you know, that's not the scare every parent out there. That is, it is important for us to have that awareness. And because it's, but it's true, right? It it's is, not to scare them, but it's true. No, it's absolutely true. And I did bring some, um, some information just around the online piece uh, from cybertip.ca. And um, they are seeing significant increases in the numbers of um, in the number of people reaching out because they have been targeted for sextortion which is what happens when somebody sends an image and then there's either a threat to you better give me money or I'm gonna release the images or send me more images if not I'll release the images yeah you get a young person who and we're yeah, explicit images of themselves and they get uh, conned into or tricked into sending pictures yep and then they get blackmailed absolutely so um those numbers particularly since 2020 and the pandemic and probably because everybody was home and engaged more online those numbers have steadily increased so I mean, often, like particularly sexual violence is a gendered issue, and you see mostly women, girls, or um, you know, gender diverse people are victimized. So, it's interesting in the sextortion, it is actually usually more uh, males who are yeah. um, victims of sextortion, and it's because they often think they are in a conversation with another um, female identifying person, yeah. and they're not. It is also a, um, a pedophile or a groomer that is targeting young men. So um, that's, that's an interesting fact about online. So the education piece is really, really important, particularly for parents to have that type of information and knowledge and understanding so they can have those conversations with uh, their young people. and. Of the reports that have come into CyberTip, about 75% of the sextortion cases have happened on Instagram and Snapchat, which is where young people spend a lot of time. So, you know, that online piece certainly makes this way more pervasive. People can be targeted in their bedroom, in rural and remote communities all across this province. Limor, we've got a minute and a half left. Any final thoughts from you? Well, the uh, internet piece is just, you know, ramping it up to a, an even more horrible level of exploitation that, you know, we certainly didn't have when I was a child. My mother was worried about me as a child uh, getting hit by a car. Yeah. yeah. And um, now we have so much more on parents to try and focus on. And I think cyber safety has to be brought into the classroom as well. And if we wrap this up with uh, less than a minute left, the, the, the push for you, what you want to see around this conversation for this province and protection of young people. I mean, it, you've been talking about a change in legislation, of new legislation from what was changed in 2010 uh, in, for, for now for the current government of the day. Yeah, to bring back supportive services, to change the definition of a child in need of protection back, and to bring back a poverty re reduction strategy. Angela Crockwell, uh, 20 seconds to you. I'd love to see lots of support for families, but also for grassroots um, community-based organizations. Those are often the places where young people are connecting first and foremost. Angela Crockwell, Executive Director of Thrive, Lynn Moore, a lawyer who works almost exclusively in the area of sexual abuse litigation. Thank you both for this conversation today. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. And for you folks listening, the signal at cbc.ca. If you have thoughts, we also have the signal line 709-576-5260 if you want to leave us a message. That is it for today's show. Tomorrow, we are talking politics with an MHA panel, tax breaks, tariffs, and top news stories that impact you. And we're asking you, and the phone lines will be open tomorrow, what would improve your quality of life in this province? And what would you like political parties to know? The lines will be open. Join us for that discussion tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Cheers. Cheers.